industrial accidents, ancient Solving poisoners, crime, poison prevention. Spills. This is Toxic History. I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Kiyaki Horowitz. He's published on the topic of toxicological history multiple times, and I'm super excited to hear him speak today. The story of botulinum antitoxin is a winding road that has been thrown off course time and again by outbreaks and setbacks. But intersections with serendipitous discoveries and support from outside our main story have helped it continue to progress to this day. But let's start from the beginning. From the 1730s until early 1800s, botulism was presumed to be from poor preparation or spoilage of food, specifically sausages thought to contain prussic acid. In 1817, however, a physician poet named Justinus Kerner suspected this wasn't so. Through study and even self-experimentation, he documented a surprisingly accurate hypothesis for a disease that would, for a time, bear his name. But it wouldn't be until 1897, when Emile van Ermengem investigated a toxic ham served at a wake in Elzell, Belgium, that we found the source, a bacterium he called Bacillus botulinum, which he proposed released a deadly toxin. Now, around the same time, there were other public health menaces we were grappling with, in particular diphtheria and tetanus. We had learned these two were toxin-mediated, and from 1888 to 1892, the work of Bering, Kitasato, Wernicke, and Ehrlich revealed that controlled exposure of these diseases to animals caused a protective response in their blood, one that we could collect. In 1897, diphtheria and tetanus antitoxins were shown to confer what we now call passive immunity in humans. So that same year, Kempner started botulinum antiserum studies and showed it could protect a guinea pig up to 24 hours after a dose that should have been fatal within 48. It would seem we had our treatment. But in 1910, when Lukes exposed his animals to the botulism strains from the Elzell outbreak and a more contemporary one in Darmstadt, he found each antitoxin was only active against the strain from which it was derived. Clearly, there must be multiple strains, and each one possibly only responsive to a unique antitoxin. Each outbreak, then, would have to be considered a novel strain until proven otherwise. In the U.S., multiple well-publicized outbreaks would occur between 1900 and 1919, resulting in 3,916 deaths. But it was the events of 1913 and 1919 that would fundamentally change our understanding yet again. The first event occurred at Stanford University when 12 sorority members were sickened and one later died. In the ensuing investigation, quote, there was no food or meal taken in common by all those poisoned except the one in question. Two cans of string beans were served that night. One was from a store and one had been home canned by one of the sorority members. In their thorough review, Wilbur and Ophels noted that the student who canned the beans had followed canning instructions provided to the public by the USDA. Despite that, it was the source of the lethal toxin. Curious about the unique things this case revealed, Dr. Ernest C. Dixon, also at Stanford, set out to see if meat wasn't necessary, and importantly, if canning was a problem. In the context of World War I, limitations on the food supply resulted in widespread encouragement of saving food this way, so this could be an alarming revelation. Dixon collected and cultured samples from multiple cases up and down the West Coast, most from a non-meat source. He then tested what he called the cold pack canning method from the USDA bulletin. Despite boiling jars in water following published timetables, gas and fermentation occurred within three weeks, and animals fed the canned vegetables died. His conclusion, the increase in home canning, increased the risk of botulism. By 1918, Dixon assembled a comprehensive monograph detailing years of botulism cases from 10 to 12 different strains and found mortality was 64%. As he observed, the extremely high mortality of botulism is an indication of the unsatisfactory results that are obtained by therapy. The percentage of fatal cases is as great today as it was 50 years ago, and we know very little more concerning treatment than did the physicians of that time. It was hoped that the antitoxic serum would be of value, but there are no available records of its use except in laboratory experiments. Like the tetanus antitoxin, the botulinus antitoxin must be given very early if it is to be effective. And it is probable that, as in tetanus, it is already too late when the symptoms of the poisoning are well established. If that wasn't bad enough, in 1919, Dixon and his colleagues revealed that certain of the methods of canning are inefficient if the raw material happens to be contaminated. This is true of commercial canners' processes as well. And this conclusion couldn't have come at a worse time. 
That same year, Armstrong's story and Scott reported in great detail the poisoning of the Sebring family of Canton, Ohio, by glass-sealed ripe olives that had been, quote, packed by a firm carrying an excellent reputation with little opportunity for foul play. Instead, the bacterium was already in the olive brine, and our then proper packaging practices we now knew were insufficient. Fortunately, Georgina Burke and her work with Dixon revealed that acidity significantly lowered the thermal death point of spores, so our professional canners could modify their processes to prevent botulism. Her second discovery, however, would change our ability to treat it. With access to 12 different strains of botulism, Burke tested and revealed all could be neutralized by one of two antitoxins. Suddenly, there was only botulism types A and B. But a serious question remained, did antitoxins help at all clinically? Animal models dating back to Kempner clearly and repeatedly showed it could up to 24 hours, but patients often presented later. So Victor Burke et al. used a rabbit model to see if delayed administration helped. It did, but only if immediately used at the onset of mild symptoms. If used after any more serious symptoms like paralysis occurred, the rabbits died. So the medical recommendations from the 1920s were decreased GI uptake, including by purging, strychnine as a stimulant to counteract the progressive weakness, and antitoxin, but only if given early and only after testing the patients for sensitivity to it. Meanwhile, in an effort to prevent further outbreaks, the California Botulism Commission was formed, and their report in 1923 emphasized the importance of updated canning methods for professional and home canners alike. By the end of the 1930s, the number of cases had peaked and started to fall. But as of 1941, we were starting to realize that Clostridium botulinum also came in types C, D, and E, which was particularly common on the West Coast up to Canada and Alaska. And it wasn't until 1946 that we even isolated the toxin to be able to study it. As we now know, C. botulinum toxin has an elegant, if terrifying, mechanism. It is initially part of a polypeptide, complexed with other proteins to help it avoid gastric degradation, so it can later be absorbed. The true toxin, this simple structure, is then cleaved from the larger peptide. Its heavy chain binds to cell surface features of neurons and undergoes endocytosis, so the light chain a zinc-dependent endopeptidase can be freed to cleave at specific sites on the snare protein complex, impairing neurotransmitter release until new proteins are synthesized. Until then, the release of acetylcholine at our neuromuscular junction is, well, paralyzed. Ideally, the antitoxin binds the circulating toxin, halting this process where it is. The challenge then is keeping the patient alive long enough to recover. Fortunately, we were also making major advancements in another medical field. By the 1940s, handheld laryngoscopes and rubber endotracheal tubes had been developed. And in the mid-1950s, surgical tracheostomy, the other airway alternative, was even being recommended by some for botulism patients. Unfortunately, from the 1950s to 1960s, case fatality remained high. So despite a paucity of evidence, the antitoxin finally found itself as the standard of care. Now, in the early 1960s, we had a divalent AB antitoxin, and as of 1962, a separate E antitoxin. There was a tetravalent ABE and F antitoxin, but it was made in Denmark. What we needed was one polyvalent antitoxin from one distributor that we could get quickly to the bedside. Finally, in 1967, an equine-derived trivalent AB and E antitoxin was licensed in the U.S., Coinciding with this, the CDC, who would facilitate distribution, released a handbook on botulism, which included updated recommendations on treatment and the phone numbers to contact for therapeutic support. By 1971, Gangarosa found case fatality had progressively fallen from 60% to less than 30. But even this article cautioned us about the risk of allergic reaction. Merson et al. in 1974 reported the rate of adverse events was 21%. Although this was better than a 30% risk of death, this was, of course, unacceptable. Particularly in one population we hadn't thought to worry about before. Prior to the 1970s, botulism was effectively unheard of in patients less than one year of age. After all, infants didn't share the same foods as older children and adults. Sadly, in 1976, Mudura and Arnon reported four cases of infant botulism. Family members who had eaten the same source, honey, in these cases, did not develop symptoms, and the authors didn't find preformed toxin. So they suspected that infant botulism might be due to ingesting the bacterium, which would form its toxin in the immature infant GI tract. 
As cases skyrocketed, a review found that antitoxin was usually not administered. And in one of the two cases it was, a severe anaphylactic reaction occurred. Even by 1990, antitoxin was thought to have no role in the treatment of infant botulism. But without it, cases were averaging 4.9 weeks in the hospital and over $4 million. Fortunately, our story was about to intersect with a discovery 70 years in the making. Back in 1925, Weinberg and Goy published a method for creating a botulinus toxoid. And from 1930 to the 1950s, the technology was advanced to improve antigenic response. For the most part, we use these toxoids to generate the antitoxin, but why not use it as a vaccine as well? One group with particular interest in a botulism vaccine was the Department of Defense, among other government agencies. And with so many federal researchers working with the highly toxic bacterium, immunizing them soon became a priority. And in the late 1950s, the Park Davis Company was even contracted by the U.S. Army to produce a polyvalent toxoid for human immunization. In 1964, researchers at Fort Detrick put their various toxoids to the test in humans. By 1965, a pentavalent botulinum toxoid was approved as an investigational new drug for all workers with an occupational risk of exposure. So what does this have to do with the antitoxin? Well, if we have an immune population, couldn't they share some of that immunity? In 1979, Metzger and Lewis from U.S. AMRID recognized the potential benefits of a human-derived antitoxin, including having less risk of foreign body reactions. So in 1982, with cases of infant botulism rising, the California Department of Health Services, CDHS, reached out to the Army with a project idea. But the road was never going to be straight. The Army wouldn't be allowed to share their research projects with the civilian sector until the 1986 Federal Technology Transfer Act delaying the project four whole years. Funding for the project wouldn't be secured until 1989 under the FDA's Orphan Drug Act. Then, to maximize catchment and enrollment of this rare disease, the researchers had to coordinate with 59 hospitals and 59 IRBs, a feat that took another year. Only as we entered the 90s was California finally ready to start clinical trials. Frankovich and Arnon even released a public announcement in the Western Journal of Medicine in 1991, notifying all its readers that the trial was soon to be underway. However, they hadn't planned for another thing. At the end of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and at the start of 1991, the U.S. entered the Gulf War. The Army recalled its botulism resources with concern they might soon need it, leaving Arnon and the other researchers in the lurch without any antitoxin to test. What now? Medical history, and toxic history in particular, I believe, is filled with these moments when progress stalls and hope seems lost, but then a light in the darkness. In the absence of the military's stockpile, scientists and researchers from all corners of the CDHS and beyond, who had been immunized for occupational prevention, volunteered their own plasma, their own bodies to the cause. The FDA quickly supported collection of antitoxin from the new source. The Massachusetts Public Health Biologic Laboratories even fractionated the first lot at no charge. Even the IRBs at all 59 hospitals were on board, coordinating approval of the substitution for the lost Army product. By 1992, only one year later, Schwartz and Arnon triumphantly returned to the Western Journal of Medicine, announcing finally the opening of patient enrollment. In May of 1997, at the end of the five-year study period, a semi-public meeting was held. Interested parties, parents of patients, and those heroic donors of source plasma were triumphantly told that the trial had successfully met all its endpoints. Pending formal licensing of the product, the FDA approved it for compassionate use, while donors were already volunteering for booster shots to ensure more could be made. In 2003, the product they were essential in creating was licensed by the FDA. Baby Big, for the treatment of infant botulism, was born. To this day, it has decreased hospital saves and saved millions of dollars for affected families. Our current formulation of Big is derived from volunteers inoculated with a more modern recombinant A and B vaccine that replaced the old pentavalent toxoid in 2011. But what if the botulism was of a different strain? And what about treating adults? Well, that's the part of the story we're in right now. In the 90s, our concern for biochemical warfare and weaponized botulism spiked. Under U.S. Army contract, researchers trying to make a safer but still effective option developed an equine-derived antitoxin that was despeciated. 
The army even got to test their new agent in the field when an outbreak of foodborne type E botulism occurred in Cairo in 1991, with promising results. So in 2010, when the old supply of A, B, and E antitoxin was set to expire, the CDC announced that it would be replacing it with a new FAB, and FAB2 heptavalent antitoxin, HBAT the agent we currently use and has been FDA approved since 2013. So what is this new agent? As you may already know, immunoglobulins have FAB regions that bind target antigens and an FC region that immune cells respond to or react against. FAB and FAB2 agents, however, lack that FC portion, reducing the risk for allergic reaction. Unfortunately, fragment-based antitoxin also has a much shorter half-life, and with reports of prolonged detection of botulism days after exposure and re-paralysis after antitoxin administration, our latest therapy still has room for improvement. Fortunately, since the late 1980s, researchers in cancer and autoimmune disease have been doing revolutionary work into the therapeutic manipulation of antibodies. We even have transgenic mice with immune systems that produce human-like antibodies, and we can make chimeric antibodies with human and non-human features. In the arena of botulinum antitoxin, we're even investigating even smaller fragments. In addition, manipulation of blood cells has been studied to produce entirely human antibodies. Although no current FDA-approved products have been made by this method, Epstein-Barr virus immortalized human B cells have been investigated for isolating antitoxin options for other emergent infectious diseases. But regardless of how we make it, how do we make sure we make enough fast enough? We continue to have periodic outbreaks of botulism, but what if we had a massive outbreak or multiple? Our technology is changing the very face of botulinum antitoxin. Maybe one of these newer discoveries, or one we haven't even thought of yet, already has the answer we need. Until then, it's important to realize the rate of mortality from botulism today is less than 5%. In the future, our diagnostics are likely to be better and faster with new PCR, endopeptidase, and antibody-based methods being investigated. And for treatment, advancements in nanoparticle and peptide development and viral gene therapy seem nearly ready to change our management paradigm altogether. But for now, this is where we are on the road of botulinum antitoxin, a road that's still winding and converging with so many interesting new developments. It will have its twists and turns, its setbacks and obstacles, but hopefully also those moments, like in a lab after World War I, or a Department of Health in early 90s California, or even just on a multi-hour conference call between a toxicologist, an ICU, a local health official, and the CDC. Those moments when folks from all corners, all interests, and all fields come together to overcome the biggest challenges of one of our smallest foes.